So in this presentation, we'll talk about conjugated systems, um, just nomenclature properties and applications, so not so. So first, let's see what conjugated system really is, okay? So conjugated system is generally going to be multiple alkenes, and alkenes, how they are connected is going to be the big thing for us, okay? So in a conjugated system, the alkenes are going to be separated by a single bond, which means that it's alternate double bond, single bond, double bond, okay? So whether it's in a straight system, aliphatic system like this, or in a cyclic system like this, okay? Double bond, single bond, double bond. That's really what matters is that you have alternate single bond, double bond. An isolated system is when the double bonds are far away. They're generally separated by a, a two a single bonds, or you can say one sp3 carbon, okay? So here, see sp2, 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 sp2 carbon. So all carbons here are sp2s, but here you have an sp3 carbon in the middle that's uh, separating the double bonds, okay? And then the last kind of a system is what's called cumulated, and the cumulated, the double bonds are right next to each other, okay? And I've shown these here, uh, in uh, cyclic systems also. So you can see what they look like because conjugation is not limited to straight chain compounds. You can have them in cyclic systems also. Nomenclature of double bonds or conjugated systems is just like double bonds. It's nothing um, you know, different than alkenes. So the only thing you'll have to say is that if something is a diene, triene, or tetraene. Um, when there are more than, of course, you have to still tell how many double bonds there are. Uh, but generally, you can say polyenes. Um, and polyenes, when you mention it, generally means conjugated also. Okay, so here, remember, we are doing everything conjugated only. So when you say a polyene, you're specifying a conjugated system. Okay, so first of all, the nomenclature is just like going to be an alkene, which means your alkene gets the priority. Uh, it has the lowest numbers, and you're going to end with an ene as well. Then wherever it's possible, you should go ahead and give cis and trans or ENZ configuration. Okay, so you remember ENZ, we'll go over that a uh, little bit if you need to, but um, anyhow, so cis and trans are used only, remember, when you have two hydrogens uh, on, on the double bond. If you don't have two hydrogens on the double bond, then you cannot do cis and trans, okay? Then you have to do the ENZ nomenclature, otherwise you can use cis and trans also, okay? ENZ, however, is like, it's considered more IUPAC and it's more thorough, okay? So there are, there's no chances for any error in ENZ. Okay, and if you have substituents, then of course, you know, double bond gets priority, gets the lower number. So let's look at over here uh, for the first one. So in this case, you have one, two, three, four. I've numbered everything. So it's a one, three penta diene. Okay, so you can say penta di one, three ene also. One, three penta diene is okay. Now the first double bond here, the one and two, that's not going to be um, ENZ or cis and trans because there are two hydrogens on one. So that's not possible, okay? So uh, for this one, you don't have to worry about E and Z, so which means that the three, four double bond, that's the only one that's going to have any sort of stereochemistry. So this one here is E. Why it is E is because the hydrogens, okay, they're going in the opposite direction, so that's a trans. Also for E, um, the, the heavier groups, the higher atomic number groups, okay, two and five, they're going in opposite direction, opposite means E, okay? So you can use trans also over here if you want to, as I've given here, because trans, it's because there are two hydrogens, okay, on carbons three and four. So either of those two is going to work, okay? All right, so here uh, in this case, uh, again, there's only one double bond uh, internally, everything else is terminal. Terminal don't have E and Z, okay? So again, when you number your carbons, uh, the double bond gets the lower numbers, okay? So one, two, and then three, five, one, three, five, hexatriene, okay? Just keep it simple. Um, when you have substitution, so in this case, the substitution as well as the double bond is in the same place. So this one, one chloro and then three methyl, and this is still hexatriene, and this is one, three, five hexatriene, so that's still there. Now, since you have a chlorine on the first carbon, now you have E and Z here as well. You cannot use cis and trans. You cannot use cis and trans on three and four also, okay? So for both of these, you have to use E and Z. 
So to do ENZ, remember you have to slice between the two carbons and then see which one has the higher um, atomic number, okay? So you slice this over here. So here is hydrogen, here is uh, hydrogen as well. So this one here is higher atomic number. This carbon here is also higher atomic number. So they're on the same side. Same side means that this is a Z. And then let's look at the other one, which is going to be our 3, 4. So here you slice it in the middle. Here is hydrogen. So between hydrogen, which is on 4 and then 5, this is heavier and then or higher atomic number. And then on carbon number 3, you have 2. And then this one, the methyl group. So 2 is going to get higher priority because double bonds have higher priority than single bonds. Okay, so now so 2 and 5 are in opposite direction, so that's going to be E. Okay, so I hope that works out for you. If not, you need to uh, kind of review that in your alkenes, okay, back um, when we did alkenes. Anyhow, okay, and then here is one for cyclo, um, you know, hexadiene. So look at the nomenclature there. Okay, <clears throat> so the thing about the conjugated systems and why we have a chapter on conjugated systems is because they are a little bit more stable, right? So first of all, let's talk about what is the order of stability. So conjugated systems are the most stable. The cumulated systems are going to be the least stable. And you can tell that they're going to be the less, you know, stable of everything because look at the double bonds. I mean, even looking at them makes me stressed out, you know. So I'm sure the double bonds are stressed out too. So, uh, you know, this is going to be the least stable of compounds. And then the conjugated systems are the most. So then the question is, what is the difference between the isolated and the conjugated that, you know, that the conjugate is even more stable than the isolated? related system. So for that reason, we have to look into how the orbitals are, okay, in the uh, double bonds. So double bonds are made up of pi bonds, right? So in pi bonds, you have these p orbitals, which are going to be overlapping. So this is the isolated system where the double bonds are separated by a CH3, uh, or excuse me, a CH2, which is sp3 hybridized. And then here is the conjugated system where uh, you have sp2, sp2 carbons, which means that every carbon is going to have a p orbital, okay? So the way I've shown it here to you, the highlighted part here, that shows you that all the p orbitals are overlapping with each other. In the case of the, con uh, the uh, isolated system, the sp3 carbon is preventing the orbitals from overlapping, okay, all the way through. So what happens is that when you have this kind of an overlap all the way through with the uh, pi orbitals or p orbitals, the pi bonds, this leads to more stability. Why does it lead to more stability? Because the electrons are now delocalized over all of these pi bonds. Okay, so that delocalization is really helpful. So it's almost like, you know, having electrons or yourself, you know, living in um, a, a studio apartment versus living in a three bedroom apartment, definitely, um, you know, you'll have more space in the three bedroom so you can kind of move around. That's kind of how the electrons also feel, right? There's more room over here. So that is the delocalization going on um, when you have this kind of a conjugated system. So generally what happens is that when we talk about stability, now what I explained to you regarding the um, you know, the, the conjugation and the delocalization of electrons, that's all good. You can use that as you wish to, okay, of course. But then we also use the MO theory, which is called the molecular orbital theory, in order to understand why something is more stable, okay? So when you have a P orbital, like in a pi bond, you have a P, a P orbital and a P orbital that are overlapping, how they overlap is going to be important, okay? So again, remember, in a pi bond, two p orbitals are overlapping. They can overlap this way, in which case your the, the positive wave function and the positive wave function 
are overlapping. Now the positive and positive, they are similar. So that means they can overlap. Here, this is not about a charge, okay? So this is not like positive and negative are going to attract. It's not a charge. Positive and negative is just a region. That's all it is. So the similar region is going to be a little bit more stable in overlapping, okay? On the other hand, <clears throat> if you have the opposite regions like this next to each other trying to overlap, this one will not overlap okay with each other and so in this case what happens is that you end up forming a node okay like this so that node that forms is not a very good thing okay so that leads to high energy a plus and a plus overlap or a minus and a minus overlap these overlaps are going to be good and this is what leads to stability so when we have conjugation how these orbitals are overlapping is also an important thing okay and so uh, sometimes stability can be explained by that <clears throat> so here is ethene okay so we'll just take a few uh, alkenes and see how this is working so the ethene it's not very hard because there's only one double bond okay so here i've shown you a little bit of an energy diagram here is my crude overlap going on with the blue um you know arcs so when you have a molecular orbital uh, diagram in the molecular orbital here is a p orbital here is another p orbital how are they going to overlap when they overlap when the two atomic orbitals overlap they form two molecular orbitals so when they form the two molecular orbitals those two molecular orbitals this, this is an mo this is an mo okay this is an atomic orbital this is atomic the bottom one here this is the low energy one okay so this is the one where you have a good overlap going on the higher one is called the antibonding which is also given by a star and that antibonding mo is generally going to have a node okay so when you have a node remember that node means that something has higher energy so where do the electrons prefer to be so here this is this atomic orbital is bringing one electron this is bringing in one electron so which means you've got two electrons to occupy so both of the electrons are going to be in the molecular orbital okay that is at the lower energy this is called bonding mo okay this one on the top is called anti-bonding mo so the anti-bonding mo is not going to have anything in it okay because these orbitals are not uh, conducive right they're not uh, compatible I should say not conducive they're not compatible okay for overlapping so this is an easy one to understand so once you understand this one all the other molecular orbitals should be a little bit easier for you to understand so in the uh, butadiene now you have two double bonds in those two double bonds we're going to have to deal with four orbitals right so one two three four each one is bringing its own electron okay so how they overlap is going to be an important thing here okay so one thing i just want to mention here before i show you the mo diagram for butadiene is that uh, the delocalization okay in case you're wondering like you know and i was talking about delocalization how that works and how do we prove also that we have delocalization that delocalization is actually proven by the fact that the single bond here is a little bit shorter than usual okay remember that uh, single bonds are longer than double bonds okay so single bonds are longer than double bonds this is greater sign so if they are longer then this bond here should be longer but it's actually not as long as one would expect so the bond length is shorter so if it is shorter something else must be causing that and that causation is that overlap okay that delocalization so when electrons are happily going around here all the time then that causes the single bond to be a little bit shorter okay so let's look at the uh, mo diagram now and uh, see how we have like this kind of a diagram so here is the uh, all the mo diagrams okay so i've shown the bonding and the anti-bonding also again my crude diagrams over here for this so all the green ones are going to be bonding all the red ones are anti-bonding here so in the bottom one which is the lowest energy one as you go higher and higher the energy actually increases okay for this one and if you want i can write that down so here energy is increasing 
So in the lowest energy is where everything is bonding. What does bonding mean again? That all the orbitals are the similar wave function. Now, as you go to a higher energy, then the number of nodes will increase. The nodes I have drawn here using the red line, okay? And the red curve that I have up here, that shows you that the over overlap is inhibited, okay? You cannot overlap over here. So as you can see, as the antibonding increases, then the number of nodes increases, and then the overlap is not possible. So if the overlap is not possible, then you don't have delocalization of electrons going on. And if you're wondering, why are we even talking about this, right? Because, I mean, technically speaking, all conjugated systems should be like this all the time. And that's true, okay? But then we also need to understand why the stability is happening, okay? And the stability is because of this sort of an overlap, okay? Which means all of these are possible, okay? They're just not happening, but they are possible to occur. So when do they occur? Again, they will occur only at a higher energy level, okay? So generally when something is at a ground state, then you will have all bonding MOs, okay? The anti-bonding MOs are going to be at a very high energy level. Generally, we'll be talking only about the bondings, right? Okay, so the next few slides, just little applications of um, alkenes or conjugated systems. So one of them, and you can read this yourself really a whole lot more. I just want to tell you that uh, natural rubber, which is obtained from nature, from, uh, you know, a plant sap, is actually a um, conjugated system. Okay, and so the natural rubber that is obtained is a conjugated system. All right, and so once you have that double, so many double bonds, then, um, you know, it, it it's a conjugated system. When we are going to learn about the reactions of the conjugated systems, and so you will see that, um, you know, why certain things have certain properties. It becomes kind of an important thing. This is natural rubber. And then here is the synthetic one, okay? And set in synthetic ones also, you have slightly different things. So this one, for example, is a cis uh, double bond. This is a trans double bond. And then here we have the, um, uh, with chlorinated, okay? So this is neoprene. Neoprene is actually very tough kind of a rubber. So these are synthetic rubbers, you know, and they're very tough. So like all the tires that are made out of rubber, they are different consistency and that different density or consistency comes from um, having different kind of groups on it, okay? So that's um, different kinds of rubbers. And then there's vulcanization. Vulcanization is done in order to make the rubber even uh, more strong, okay? And that is that cross-linking makes the rubber a little bit more sturdy. And that cross-linking is done with sulfur bonds, okay? And uh, it was Mr. Goodyear who actually did that. So yeah, Goodyear tires. So when he did that, you know, it came uh, to be uh, this kind of a branching system that was going on and cross-linking that was going on, which made, you know, the rubber really very sturdy. And also like when we say that you smell rubber, sometimes like somebody breaks really hard and you smell something, that's really sulfur you're smelling, not really rubber. I mean, you can smell rubber also. It has, uh, you know, an aroma, uh, but sulfur is really what you smell a lot more. And then this is really the interesting part here. I find this really interesting about, um, you know, the chemistry of vision and how we actually see, um, uh, how we see anything, okay? So there's rhodopsin in our, in our, in our eyes. And so, you know, when the light hits it, then the cis bonds become trans bonds. And when they become trans bonds, suddenly you start seeing things, you know. And so it's kind of very interesting how the how the vision works. Such a small thing going from cis to trans bonds and suddenly you see everything, you know, um, quite interesting. So that's all we have in this one. Uh, we'll go on further to do reactions.